Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. There's even a brand new Brigadier General tier where you can get a shout out on a Commander's Quarters episode that's dedicated to you. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Quarters studio. Welcome to the show. So 2022 has finally arrived and, well, continues a, a strange trend of uh, unexpected spoilers, let's just call them, from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Now, the official spoiler season doesn't start off until the end of this month, I believe on the 27th, but again, we keep just getting small snippets from random people on the internet showing off what are, you know, supposedly cards from the set that now seem to be pretty legit. So what are these new potential Kamigawa spoilers and what do they do? Well, let's jump into it to find out. So recently on Reddit, this image popped up and again, yes, I know that everyone out there is not a professional photographer. I'm not either, but a little less grain would be nice. Yeah, a little, a little more lighting there. Regardless, I should not be complaining. I am very sorry. Anyways, let's move on to my MTG.Design custom card version of this just so it's easier to discuss. So we've got Iganjo Seat of the Empire, a legendary land that can tap for a white. But that's not all, because that would be a terrible, terrible card if that was the case. Anyways, it has channel for two in a white, and that basically means we can discard it and then we get an effect. And that effect is it deals four damage to target attacking or blocking creature. This ability costs one less to activate for each legendary creature you control. Now again, I just want to reiterate, this has not been confirmed to be an actual card from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, but with this discussion, I'm going to be moving forward with the assumption that it is, and I'll talk about some reasons why I think it's legitimate. Yeah. Regardless, this seems like a very powerful land and one that I think is going to see a good amount of play, again, if this is a real card. Obviously, this being legendary essentially means absolutely nothing in Commander because, well, you're not going to be running multiple copies of a land in your deck outside of basic lands. And actually, it, it, it being legendary can be an upside as well, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. Regardless, the fact that this land does not come into play tapped is obviously huge, allowing you to just tap for mana right away, just like as if it were a Plains. But unlike being a Plains, it also has a fantastic channel ability. This is essentially a combat trick removal spell that just comes on a land for free. Four damage to an attacking or blocking creature is generally going to be enough to take them out, especially in combination with, you know, actually either blocking or having your creature blocked, etc, etc, etc. And the actual cost of it being two and a white isn't really all that much, again, for this just being stapled onto a land that already comes into play untapped. On top of that, again, for every single legendary creature you control, like you know, your commander, you are going to be reducing that cost. So even just with your commander in play, this just costs you two mana, and again, if you've got two legendary creatures in play, this just costs you one mana, which is pretty absurd. Now, I'm not saying that this card, wow, is so powerful, it has to be in every single deck out there, but there are definitely certain kinds of decks out there where it's going to be hard to argue or hard to find any kind of a reason not to include this card. Okay you know, outside of, you know, price. Now, obviously, there are some reasons, like there being more cards out there that remove non-basic lands or punish you for non-basic lands, or, you know, the fact that this doesn't have a land type on it, so you can't tutor this up, you know, like a rampant growth, and you don't want to fail on a search if you don't have enough basics in your deck, etc., etc., etc. That being said, again, just being a land that comes into play untapped, taps for something more than a colorless, essentially, and, you know, gives you a fantastic effect, yeah, this card, I think, is going to be in pretty high demand. If you are in a mono-white deck, it's going to be very difficult to argue against including this card outside of, again, price. And I personally would probably even extend that to maybe even two-color where it comes to these kinds of cards. It's kind of hard to argue against them if you're not talking about price because, well, it's just a land that gives you a fantastic effect on top of just being a land that comes into play untapped. Regardless, now let's move on and talk about one of the reasons why I think this spoiler is probably pretty legitimate. 
So on a previous episode on this channel, I talked about these potential Kamigawa spoilers, and I went back and forth on whether I thought they were real or not. And actually, in that episode, ironically, I thought that they probably weren't real, and I leaned on that side, but gave reasons for each side. Regardless, one of the main reasons I didn't think they were real is that the set symbol wasn't really all that clear, and it kind of looked kind of goofy, but then when we saw some actual spoilers, it confirmed the set symbol, which kind of matched up, so yeah, these are probably real. Anyways, one of those spoilers was Takanua Abandoned Mire, a very similar legendary land, but this one taps for a black. It also has channel in an axe in a similar way, pay three and a black, discard it, mill three cards and return a creature, planeswalk card from your graveyard to your hand. This ability costs one last to activate for each legendary creature you control. So again, very similar to a Ganjo, a legendary land that comes into play untapped, taps for one color, has a channel ability, and that reduction cost for legendary creatures is there too. So the fact that we've seen a previous potential spoiler that is somewhat similar and kind of leans toward, hey, this is probably going to be a cycle, which you know, we've already kind of speculated before, makes it seem like this new spoiler is pretty legitimate. And when it comes to cycles, let's talk about the previous cycle that we've seen before in the original Kamigawa. Or maybe I, I should say a cycle plus one. Back in Champions of Kamigawa, we got the actual cycle, and then we saw some somewhat similar cards. In, in Saviors of Kamigawa, we got Oboro, Palace in the Clouds, which does somewhat of a similar thing. And again, if these cards are any kind of an indicator for how expensive these new cards might be, yeah, their prices could get pretty up there. Although I will say that I believe, and again, I'm not in MTG Finance, but I believe that the original Kamigawa had a very low print run. Please correct me below in the comments if I am wrong on that, but yeah, I believe that could influence some of these prices, but still. There is definitely a demand out there for these kinds of lands in Commander. I mean, let's quickly take a look at this old cycle, plus one. Oboro Palace in the Clouds is a legendary land that taps for a blue, and you can pay one to return it to its owner's hand. This thing goes infinite in a lot of different ways, kind of like some of the bounce lands, so yeah, that's why this commands such a high price. Moving on, the next three most expensive of these lands are Shizo Death Storehouse, Shinka the Bloodsoak Keep, and Minamo School at Water's Edge. Shizo taps for a black, and it says, pay a black tap, target legendary creature gains fear until end of turn. Being able to basically make your commander unblockable, yeah, that's a very powerful thing to just slap on a land that comes into play untapped. Shinka the Bloodsoak Keep taps for a red, and has pay a red, tap, target legendary creature gains first strike until end of turn. So yeah, a great way to boost or protect during combat. And then Minamo School at Water's Edge taps for a blue, and it can pay a blue to tap untapped target legendary permanent. I would love this one to be more budget-friendly for my Garth deck, but unfortunately, no, it definitely is not. And even the two, let's just say, lesser lands of this cycle are still decently expensive with a Ganjo Castle and Okina, Temple to the Grandfathers. The Ganjo Castle taps for a white, and it has pay a white tap for the next two damage that we dealt target legendary creature this turn. In Okina, Temple to the Grandfathers has tap for a green, pay a green, tap target legendary creature gets plus plus one until end of turn. So again, definitely not as splashy of effects, but again, if this original cycle of lands is any indication, we're probably going to see another cycle, and we've already potentially seen two of the lands again, with these potential spoilers. That being said, really quickly, let's talk about some potential types of commanders that might want this new Iganjo. First up again, outside of price, it's going to be really hard to argue against including this card in essentially any mono white deck. So yeah, just throw out Heliod Suncrown, the most popular mono white deck. Yeah, again, base leaders taking up a land slot for a removal spell. So take out a planes, put that in. That's probably what most players are going to do. Next up, legendary matters decks like maybe an Eska God of the Tree deck that, you know, utilizes the front side of Eska and utilizes a lot of legendary creatures. Again, being able to just, you know, use that land's channel ability for just one mana can be huge. Though, again, it being five color can, you know, also include some problems with that inclusion. So maybe let's just actually say like Captain Sisse Legendary Matters decks, where it's a two color deck, which Sisse can tap and, you know, search your library for a legendary card, put in your hand. Yeah, that could be a place for it. And speaking of Legendary Matters, even a three color deck like a Kethis the Hidden Hand would probably love this kind of a card. It has exile two legendary cards from your graveyard until end of turn each legendary card in your graveyard gains. You may play this card from your graveyard. Obviously, this legendary land can easily get in your graveyard by, you know, you actually just channeling it. So it's just an easy way to get Kethis more fuel for the fire. But now we've talked about this potential legendary land, let's talk about the other potential spoiler. And that would be Iganjo Uprising. And it looks like a shiny version and it looks actually pretty cool. That being said, just for ease of use of talking about this again, thank you mtg.design, here is a custom card. Iganjo Uprising is a sorcery for X, Red, White, and it says create X22 White Samurai Creature Tokens with Vigilance. They gain Menace and Haste until end of turn. Also, each opponent creates X-1 22 White Samurai Creature Tokens with Vigilance. This is a really interesting and spicy card, and I really hope that this is a real spoiler because, well, 
There aren't too many cards that do something like this. Basically, an undercosted way to make a giant token army, yes, it's sorcery speed, but those tokens temporarily gain menace and haste to help you hit really quickly and for a good amount of damage. But by doing that, you also give all of your opponents that many samurai with vigilance minus one. Now, in a format like Standard, this probably could be somewhat of a finisher because even if your opponents do get those Samurai, you know, it's just one opponent that you're giving them to, and you can probably swing through that Menace and get through enough damage to win. But in a format like Commander, you are dishing out a lot more tokens because you've got more opponents. Now, we'll go through some ways to actually make this a bit more one-sided here in a bit. But yeah, there aren't that many effects out there that are much like this, and I really like the design. I mean, the first card that came to my mind when I saw this new potential spoiler was Sylvan Offering, which is a sorcery for X and a green. It says choose an opponent, you and that player each create an XX green tree fall creature token, and choose an opponent, you and that player each create X11 green elf warrior creature tokens. So with this one, it's not for all opponents. You can split it up, you know, giving either, you know, one opponent a tree folk and one opponent some elves, or, you know, one opponent both. But again, you're not giving every opponent everything. Versus this new spoiler, which is like, hey, yeah, I mean, you get the most samurai, but your opponents get that many minus one. That being said, again, like I mentioned, there are definitely ways to make this a bit more one-sided. Like, you know, Anointed Procession, or Cathar's Crusade, or Divine Visitation. Anointed Procession is an enchantment that costs three and a white, and it says if an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it creates twice that many of those tokens instead. So, hey, okay, I'm gonna make uh, six samurai. Uh, you each get five samurai. Oh, but, okay, wait, I get to double up mine, so I get 12, actually. And the Cathar's Crusade is an enchantment that costs three white, white, and it says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one counter on each creature you control. So in that same situation, your opponents might get their five samurai, but you're going to be getting six samurai that each come into play with six plus plus one counters on them, and you're giving counters to other creatures that are already in play too. And then Divine Visitation is an enchantment for three white, white, that says if one or more creature tokens be created under your control, that many four, four white angel creature tokens of flying and vigilance are created instead. So this one basically says, okay, your opponents, yep, they still get their samurai, but instead of you getting some 2-2 two -two Samurai, you are getting 4-4 four -four Flying Vigilant Angels. So yeah, again, there are ways to make this into more of a one-sided effect. Speaking of which... Of course, you know, you can just have Elish Norn in play, and then your opponents are going to be pretty, well, dead and not very happy with you. Elish Norn is a 4-7 Praetor with Vigilance that says other creatures you control get plus 2, plus 2, and creatures your opponents control get minus 2, minus 2. So here are some 2-2 two -two Samurai for your opponent. Oh no, Elish Norn says they get minus 2, minus 2. Well, y you got them, but they're gone. Oh, oh, and my samurai, they're 4-4s, they're so you're all probably gone. Or, you know, on a future turn, you can combine that donation of samurai with something like a mob rule or an insurrection to gain control of those samurai to wipe out your opponents as well. So yeah, plenty of ways to turn this into a more one-sided effect. Now, when it comes to types of commanders that actually might want to utilize this card, the first ones that came to my mind were those group hug style commanders like Canaris and Tiro. Now, there are different levels of group hug, and actually, when it comes to group hug decks that I typically like to build, I build them more in what, let's just say, political control types of builds, so they can utilize this card in different ways. I mean, another way to utilize this card might be in a more chaotic way, like Corona False God, you know, where Corona basically can pump creatures of a certain type, and by giving everyone a bunch of samurai, well, everyone's going to be swinging with some massive samurai now, and you can probably incentivize opponents to swing elsewhere. And speaking of that, how about Gahiji Honored One, which does just that. It has whenever a creature attacks one of your opponents or a planeswalker and opponent controls, that creature gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. So swing elsewhere, and those samurai are going to hit harder. Or you can actually force your opponents to swing elsewhere with a commander like Marisi Breaker of the Coil. It has whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, go to each creature that player controls. So just by getting one creature through, now all those samurai are goaded and they have to attack an opponent. And actually another commander that Eddie brought up is Firesong and Sunspeaker because this kind of a commander loves having creatures in play under your opponent's control because, well, you just cast one board wipe and then you're basically gaining a ton of life for each creature. Again, I basically mean a red based board wipe. And actually, my apologies, I said that in a really kind of roundabout way. Basically, hey, cast Blasphemous Act, gain 13 life for each creature on the board. So again, the more creatures on the board, the better. Regardless, at the end of the day, with everything that we know so far about the set, and with, you know, previous cards from Kamigawa, and with these new potential spoilers that we've seen and ones previously, yeah, I definitely am leaning toward these being legitimate spoilers. 
But again, please take everything in this episode and, you know, previous, you know, potential spoiler episodes with a grain of salt because I very well could be wrong. So come to your own conclusions with what you know about these cards and we'll see in the future if these are actually real or not. And with that, the show has come to a close, so it's my turn to hear from you. So make sure you comment below and let me know what your thoughts on this episode are. And as always, thanks again and have a good one.